Aero, aerospace has been one of the foremost bases of economic and prestigious growth of our West Coast. Companies with familiar names gain world leadership in advancing the complex technologies required. Boeing, Convair, Douglas, Lockheed, North America, Northup, and Ryan. Just about everyone has heard of Howard Hughes, his wealth, secrecy, and eccentricities. Few know that his small experimental aircraft company transformed itself into the preeminent defense electronics firm on the globe, with more than 80,000 employees and hundreds of diverse products. The company led advances in radars, guided missiles, electro-optics, sonars, computers, spacecraft, and large intelligence networks. Many devices prominent in public use today were invented there. Lasers, digital watches, night sights, communication satellites, cell phone processors, microelectronics, and direct TV. To achieve this, the corporation practiced unique operating techniques that fostered inventive creativity and attracted superb talent. At its peak, there were 22,000 engineers and scientists, including 4,000 PhDs. Richardson's pictorial talk will include an overview of many of these technologies, as well as a summary of why it all became possible through an extraordinary management style. Naturally, some previously untold colorful tales of Mr. Hughes will be relished. And as mentioned, a question and answer time will follow, as well as signing of his book, Hughes After Howard. And now I would like to present to you Ken Richardson. Thank you, Melanie. If you've seen the movie The Candidate with Robert Redford, it's a very interesting start because he's a candidate for Senate in California. There's this huge auditorium, and he's going to give this great speech. There was one person in the audience. <laughs> By golly, he gave it the best shot he could anyway. That's what I'll do today. Thank you for coming and for being willing to listen. We were obviously hoping for a lot more. Why is that? We have a story, I think, that really should be a means of emulation, studied for emulation by other industry companies in the United States. You're going to hear me say many times, we were the best, we did the first, blah, 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 blah. We really did. And like Muhammad Ali, we were the greatest. You'll probably get tired of hearing that, but I have to keep saying it because in many cases, we really did. We made the breakthroughs. We did the things that no one else could do. As you heard, many other companies such as Boeing and others named are well known to the world. They're very common names because they made the vehicles that people can see. But the thing that's not understood is all those vehicles are very dependent on electronics. We provide the eyes, the ears, the brains, the weaponry, the analysis of all the data for the benefit of the pilot so the pilot can do the proper thing. So those things are unrecognized. They're buried within the machine was always a frustration to us at our company because we were never recognized very well. Because of that factor, our equipment was buried, was invisible. But it was that which made the mission possible, whether it was combat or air transportation or whatever the vehicle wants to do, searches in space, et cetera, et cetera. I'm going to outline our background. I'm going to go through it pretty quick. So please pay attention. Because we had a plethora of hardware items spanning the entire electromagnetic spectrum, 
it's really amazing what we did. And we were capable of, once again, being first in all regards. It all began with good old Howard Hughes. And I'll say a little about him as we go. Here he is when he was about 20. Ladies in the audience, isn't he handsome? <laughs> if he came to Hollywood and you had the opportunity to date him, wouldn't you say yes? Of course you would. There he was. When he was, uh, his father, oh, I went too far. I already made an error one time. There, his father had a patent in 1909 for a dual bit drilling machine, or a bit, which was called the Rock Eater. It was the best power bit that had ever been designed for drilling for oil through the uh, overlayer that hides the uh, oil field. He participated in the famous teapot dome, not the scandal part, but the good part, which is millions of dollars of money were spent for drill bits in order that people could drill new holes to gather this oil. From it was created the Hughes Tool Company, which became very, very wealthy. In 19, when he was 19 years old, Howard's father died. So Howard inherited 75% ownership. However, he wasn't of full age. The rest of the ownership was other relatives. So he petitioned the court in Texas to claim him as an adult, which they did when he was 20. He then purchased the other 25%. So he's a complete owner of the Hughes Tool Company. It became then the basis for the funding for all that came ahead, of which there are many, many adventures and many things. In 1925, he went to Hollywood. His uncle Rupert had gone there in 1922 to start into the movie business, and Howard thought that would be kind of fun to try, and he did. He had many different movies that he sponsored, two of which were very famous. One was Hell's Angels that you see up on the left, with Gene Harlow. It actually used 85 relics of World War, World, World War I combat aircraft. And I think there were about six or eight of those that were lost in the filming process. But that was very successful. Down the lower right corner, you'll see another one, which is The Outlaw with Gene Russell. That was 1943. Those were the two big successes, although there were many others. You see him at the left as he was wooing many starlets in Hollywood. And the count rose up to about 24. Some of them you have heard of, like, uh, for instance, Catherine Hepburn, who I think is one of the best actresses ever. He taught her to fly. She got her pilot's license after being trained by Howard Hughes. Then uh, another one is uh, like the story of a friend of mine who was an associate pilot, was Howard's pilot, and he was assigned the job once to fly two actresses, Rita Moreno and Terry Moore, from Long Beach to Las Vegas. It was scheduled in the early morning, so they all three went down to a hotel in Long Beach. Howard called every half hour to the pilot to find out what those girls were doing. <laughs> and they were both behind locked doors, and so he gave that assurance. And he got the manager to give the assurance, but every half hour. Now, if you were a pilot, you realize if you only get that kind of little sleep, you got a tough job flying the next uh, morning to uh, Las Vegas. Another one was uh, Elizabeth Taylor. He tried to squire her around, and she was always accompanied by her mother as a, as a uh, what do you call it, uh, overlooker for good reason. So 24 of them. Another one up on the right, you'll see a thing called Hollywood. That is a sign which is 57 feet high and 357 feet long, 27 feet high and 327, big, huge thing, which, as you know, is a symbol of Los Angeles these days in hills overlooking Los Angeles. It was originally put together in 1924 as a real estate promotion and it was called Hollywood Land at the time. The other four letters were removed. In 1930, Howard purchased that property and he said to 
Ginger Rogers, that is your, where your estate will be, and we will live there together forever. After six months, she said, I don't think I want to do that. Goodbye. So he then, he still owned the property and owned it for many years, and it wasn't until 1992 that it was finally, through volunteers, donated to Los Angeles as a symbol of Los Angeles. So once again, many ladies, and he was very successful in the business. In 1932, he started a company in Burbank, California, and leased space by Lockheed Company to build what he wanted to be, set a new record. He always attempted in everything he did to be the best, to reach beyond what anyone else had ever done. So this is the H1 racer. And in 1935, he set a new circular speed record of 357 miles per hour and beat everyone else. It was a magnificent airplane. It had about eight superb new design features, one of which you can easily visualize, which is flush riveting to cut the drag down. And there were quite a number of other things. Those were emulated by the Japanese Zero and the Focke Wolf 190 by the Germans almost immediately when they saw the benefits. And once again, to pick on our government, it took our government until 1943 to use any of these ideas in our combat aircraft. That's now at the uh, Smithsonian, and by the way, it was extended, it was called the winged bullet by Mr. Hughes, <laughs> extended the wings greatly and put more fuel in in order to do a cross-country record setter, which it did. He also had another first, which is to go around the world quicker than anyone else had. This is a Lockheed Super Vega. He flew to engine airplane, took three, days, 17 hours and 29 minutes, set a new record, New York to New York, and uh, did a good thing. And the most significant thing about it, about it, he realized how important it was to have electronics, specifically radios, for navigation and for communication. And the guy that was in there with him on the ground, sorry, that managed the ground systems, a guy called Dave Evans, was very significant later in our Hughes Aircraft Company. The company started then to expand and prepare for World War II, purchase property in Marina del Rey or Playa del Rey near the Los Angeles airport. And this building, you see a set of buildings was set up in 1941. The turf was picked by Noah Dietrich, who was his principal business manager in Houston and with Hughes to a company. The reason he picked it is it's a flyway for ducks migrating north and south uh, biannually, and he was a duck shooter. So he said, I can do that by going there and going out at noon and shooting ducks, which is an interesting reason for picking it. However, it was all swampland, marshland. We, who later worked for the company, sort of regretted that because we had, well, a good way, could be enjoyed it, because frequently, if it rained very heavily, it would all be flooded and there would be maybe this much water on the parking lots. So we had to abandon periodically the buildings about noon. Kind of nice, you get to go home. And there was some great stories about what happened because of that flooding. One, true story, a woman was driving a Volkswagen down the exit road. It was a rushing stream there, caught her up, and she went right down the drain with a car and everything, never seen again. Anyway, so it wasn't ever a good place to go. But it expanded from there, and as you see on the right, upper right, is the famous hangar building where the flying boat we'll talk about was built. And right below that, you'll see its wing being assembled. That's the largest wooden building that's ever been built. That's contested by the Japanese, and I went to a place where there was a building that burned down that they claim was bigger. Nonetheless, Six stories high, 740 feet long, and there are two major bays. It was made big enough in order to accommodate that great flying boat that we're going to hear more about. And there's Mr. Hughes in his office. During World War II, we had a population of about employees about 6,000. And we did two things. We kept working on that giant flying boat. 
as well as the XF-11, which is a photo reconnaissance airplane. And those of you who are familiar with airplanes realize it's very similar in design to the P-38. This also was made out of wood, as the great flying boat was. It had a new feature, which is a dual spinning two different uh, propellers on the front of the engines, and they were counter-rotating. They also had the thrust reverse capability, and they were governed by hydraulic systems. And because of those hydraulic systems, there was a failure when Howard was flying one of these, and he then had his big crash, and he crashed into a uh, golf course up in uh, the upper part of Los Angeles. He was in the hospital for many, many money, months. And by the way, while he was there, he invented some of some, some things you may have used, which is a, a electrically operated hotel bed, uh, hospital bed, which bends and moves around, and you can self-control the position you want to be lying in. I just came out of the hospital myself, and I'm delighted that he invented that thing and made it much more comfortable. By the way, let me tell you a joke about me. I got many jokes about me. One is I, we were recently, Charlotte and I were on a cruise, and there were many Australians aboard, and of course they have a very great sense of humor. And this guy came up to me and he says, oh, you look like you had an OBE. I said, what? As you know, the British order of, of Grand Empire is an OBE. He said, no, 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 no. You're over bloody 80, aren't you? <laughs> I said, yeah. But anyway, that's the airplane he crashed in. And if you want to know more about that, it turns out I met the two doctors that saved him. And uh, he had many, many broken bones. But the biggest problem they had was, whoop, normally your heart is right here. And most people, maybe not all people, his uh, entire chest cavity was filled with blood. And the heart was displaced physically to the other side. So he had to open them all up and put that all back together. Absolutely amazing anybody would survive that. And incidentally, that's when the nuttiness began. He was always an inspiring leader, always wanted to do the best thing. He was a sort of a creative inventor. At least he got other people to be inspired to create and invent. But then he became a drug addict. And unfortunately, that's when all the funny stuff started happening. In 1947, he was called before the Senate to give testimony. He had claimed against the government 23 million overdue funds as part of the uh, great uh, spruce goose, as you may call it, uh, cost. And he had also invested in his own money of $7 million, but the government owed him 23. So he had to go through a hearing. That was quite a hearing because up against him was a guy named Owen Brewster, who was a senator from Maine very prominent guy, and Mr. Hughes took him apart, took him to pieces, because it turns out he was kind of a corrupt guy. And where they were trying to accuse Howard Hughes of doing something, they found out that the accuser was really bad, so he got kicked out of the Senate right away, which is kind of interesting. And uh, that was uh, almost a year after his big, big plane crash. So even then, he was on the drugs, but he was still functioning reasonably well. And of course, the great flying boat, the HK-4 Hercules, or whatever you want to call it. It's a huge, huge airplane, the biggest that's ever been built, 440,000 pounds lifting capacity, eight engines, as you see. And there it is in Long Beach, just after it was assembled. A uh, mentor of mine had been responsible for the structural support of all the engines. And he had many stories about how the glue worked and how they did this and how they de did that. But here's the story I like. Mr. Hughes always wanted to review the drawings. What design, what was it like, could I make it better? And so one night, he got a call, five o'clock, says, come on up to my place in Bel Air. I want to see the drawings, latest drawings on your design. So he brought two other guys with him. They got there at 10 p.m., sat there for two hours while the butler gave them coffee and all that so forth, so forth. And they were very, very quiet then and wondering what's going to happen. And they heard two, step, two sets of high heels go running down the stairs to the back entrance. And then they heard 
come on up, you guys, I want to see the drawings. And there was Howard in his bed, in his pajamas, and he reviewed those drawings for two hours. That is stamina. In, uh, in November of 1947, he did fly that airplane, you know, 80 feet off the water, one mile distance. And his right was a guy named Dave Grant, who was a guy that designed the hydraulics for that airplane and also associated with what I did later, some of our guided missiles, hydraulics. The reason he was in the right seat was Howard was most concerned about the hydraulic control systems in the airplane and he wanted an advisor there in case something went wrong, which it did not. When in the Senate hearings talking about this airplane, his final statement was, that airplane will fly or I will never return to the United States. So that's the reason he flew that airplane. He wanted to come back to the United States. We also built a thing called the uh, Oh, I forgot, HK-48, I think, it's a helicopter anyway. The largest helicopter ever designed was to carry tanks, and it had a 104-foot rotor. The way it was powered was a jet engine inside the fuselage. The hot gases went up then through the hub out to the end of the uh, rotors and nozzles, spun it around, that was the way the power was done. The problem with it was that the wingtips, because it was so large in diameter, reached supersonic speed, so there was a lot of flutter all the time and never was really solved. One of these crashed in test, the other did not. I got to see it fly, and later in my career, I worked on stealth, where you don't want the enemy to know you're there. You could hear this thing about five miles away. Boy, that was not very stealthy. Wow, 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 what a noise. But that was a helicopter. We were a family group. As I said, 6,000 people in World War II. It declined to only 600 when the war ended. But then a miracle happened. These two guys, Cy Ramo and Dean Wooldridge, who were with Bell Labs and with, uh, uh, who else it was? John Lecter. John Lecter, yeah, is that right? No, anyway, sorry. Um, convinced the Air Force that they needed help to design air intercept weapons that are much more capable. We were worried about the Soviet threat and intercontinental bombers coming to us, and you need to intercept them at long range. So you need better radars and better guided missiles to be effective. And the Air Force became convinced that they should do that at this secretive company called Hughes Aircraft Company. It did have a radio division, which Dave Evans, the guy that did that uh, around the world radio stuff was running. So there's something to start with. But these two brought an inspirational start to what became an outstanding company. However, that was 1946. 1953, they became very disillusioned because Howard Hughes had some constraints on their ability to function. He had to give permission for this, that, and the other thing. They would ask for it, and he would never answer. So we were just in limbo all the time. So the, uh, they went into what's called a management revolt, and about the top three layers of the company left. The Air Force also came in and said to Howard, Mr. Hughes, you get a manager who's got full capability, a general manager, to run this company because we need what you're doing, and uh, you gotta do it within two months. Mr. Hughes said, you can't talk like that to me. The head of the Air Force said, yes, I can, because if you don't, I'll withdraw all the contracts in one day. Howard said, oh. <laughs> so a search went out then for new leaders. Meantime, and, and then it was decided by Hughes and other technical people that he should move to Las Vegas, stay more remote, but also uh, donate the company, Hughes Aircraft Company, away from Hughes Tool Company to become, or to become the principal source of funding for the Howard Hughes Medical Institute, which was a nonprofit, and turns out it's still the largest medical support outfit in the world for medical research and support of universities, medical universities. By the way, it's now worth about uh, 
30 billion dollars, I guess, in their assets. Okay, he went to Las Vegas and bought uh, six hotels, two television stations, many, many mining sites, and became very successful. In fact, his ownership was such that it contributed 13% of the state's annual economy. Quite a big thing. And there are many funny stories about him at the Sands. For example, he liked the movie Ice Station Zebra, and he watched it something like 150 times, several times a day. That's a little bizarre. I didn't even like the movie. And uh, he liked a certain kind of ice cream, so he got, it was a banana nut ice cream. The manager of the hotel was concerned that they would run out, so he bought one year supply of it. And the next day, Howard decided he didn't like that flavor anymore. <laughs> Pretty tough. And the one I liked was told by an actress friend of mine, and true, that you, if you all like James Bond movies, which I always did, especially Charlotte because of Sean Connery being in it, dog on it. I'm not Robert Redford, I'm not Sean Connery, but anyway, I keep trying. Uh, anyhow, Albert Broccoli, great name, was the producer. And he was a good friend of Howard. So Howard managed to get the whole strip abandoned for several, six days, I think it was, while the filming of one of those James Bond movies was done. No other people were allowed there. That's control. He stayed very active in his uh, empire, let's call it, in the movies, RKO Studios. He purchased that um, 1948 sold it in 1955 for a big loss, $20, $25 million he sold it for. And his problem was that he kept firing all the very competent managers. And uh, it, it really went downhill, and it, you have to point the finger at him for doing that. He also was very active in the airline business. He purchased TWA starting in 1939, a portion of it. And in 1966, he sold it for the largest value ever recorded for such a company, $547 million. Today, when you see these companies being sold for billions, you say, well, that's nothing. Well, wait a minute, there's always something, and there's big inflation we've had ever since. He also created two other airlines, by the way. Down in the lower left, you see the Glomar Explorer. Many people associate that with Hughes Aircraft Company. No, that was Hughes Tool Company that did that very secretively for the CIA. As you know, its mission was to go and recover a Soviet submarine that had uh, ballistic missiles in it, and off, I think it was off Chile, off, somewhere off South America. And it was successful, except the submarine broke in half as they brought it up, so it wasn't completely a success. And they stayed in the helicopter business, and if you've heard of the OH-6, it's a very small, little, wonderful helicopter, which is still being produced. And I believe Hughes Tools sold that to McDonnell, I believe, I can't remember. The new leadership then was found. They were the epitome of excellence in leadership, a balanced team of three guys. The guy on the left is uh, Pat Hyland. He came from Bendix. He used to be a flyer for the uh, Navy. He's, no, he's in the Army, I guess, in World War I. He then got into the naval communication business, and he was working with aerial uh, electronics for radios for the Navy. And then he worked for Bendix, an excellent guy because he had great long-term vision and superb integrity, which our company really fostered. And throughout our company and all individuals, you had to be that way, and it was his, his leadership. The guy in the middle is um, Alan Puckett, Dr. Alan Puckett, one of the most smart, smartest technical people in the world. He invented many of the things in guided missiles that are still used today that are far better than anybody else had ever invented. His principle was aerodynamics. So he's an inspiring technical leader. And when you went to a meeting with him, you sure better know the technical answer for what you were gonna talk about. The guy on the right is named Richardson, not related to me, unfortunately. He was one of my very close mentors. He had been in the Air Force. He was a B-29 pilot in World War II, and he worked at the Wright Field uh, for a while. And then he came to uh, California to work for RKO Studios, I guess it was. And he couldn't stand the uh, Hollywood crowd, so he then moved to Hughes Aircraft Company. 
He was also an inspiring leader because he was a people person. Anybody liked him, and he would immediately be able to respond and react to anybody, no matter what their job was or what they were trying to do. He was a magnificent guy. I just, by the way, I told you he was one of my mentors. As I was coming along, we had a very, very critical meeting with the Navy, several admirals and big problems. And we got through it well. <clears throat> I had to do most of it myself. And he was there. And so I said afterwards, uh, John, did I do that OK? And he says, I've taught you all the big things. Now you just got some little things to work on. Well, I'll tell you, when you have a mentor that says something like that, you are really inspired. OK, these are our logo series. The one on the upper left, you might not be able to see it, but it commemorates the round of the world flight of 1938. And that was used uh, till about 1950. The one on the upper right was when I came there in 1952. Hughes were trying to get away from the name aircraft company because we were almost all electronics. By the way, when I came in 1952, we had uh, 15,000 people. And those three leaders that I just showed you grew us to 85,000 people in a very short time. And uh, then we tried even harder. Hughes Aircraft Company, you can hardly see the word aircraft. And then to the right, you'll see GM. Because of government regulations relative to the Howard Hughes Medical Institute, we were forced to be auctioned. There were a number of contenders. It was near zero down to five finishers. I was running the missile group at the time, and I had to brief them legally, correctly, and fully on what we were doing. Two of them were our arch competitors, two of the contenders as finalists. That is a tough road to walk, because you have to say what you must say, but you don't want to tell them stuff that you don't want them to know, because if they bought you, it's OK. But they remained your competitor, you got a problem. Anyway, the winner was General Motors, so we became a subsidiary of General Motors. And they didn't monkey with us very much. It was kind of nice. We got to operate as we always had, as if we were sort of still a privately owned company. It was, uh, it was a good marriage. However, in 1992, the government decided again to do the right thing with terrible consequences. The right thing was, in this case, to demand of all corporations greater liquid assets to support their liabilities for future benefits to their employees, like retirement and medical. You had to have a lot more cash in order to be accepted by the government. General Motors didn't have very much cash, so they had to then sell their most successful subsidiaries. By the way, our earnings for three years carried General Motors from having a dead loss. That's pretty good. So we got sold as long as, and several others. So then we were chopped up into four pieces and sold to other uh, companies, one of which is Boeing that owns the uh, spacecraft part. I'm probably taking too much time. Let's get going here. OK, then we expanded, as I said, to 85,000 people. There's our motherland at Culver City that started in 1941, I told you about, upper left. Upper right is what I consider heaven because I worked at Canoga Park in the outer San Fernando Valley for 10 years. That's our missile group. And it's just like a college campus. So if you want creativity, you want people to do a good job, you like, they like to be in a good place to do it. And that certainly was. Down on the lower left is the research facility overlooking the Malibu beaches of all places. And it was rated as the number one research lab in the United States for many years. Had 400 people, most of whom were PhDs. And to the right, you see what I think personally was a not, shouldn't have been done. When I went to corporate, we just finished building a new facility for the executive branch. And that's the atrium that I looked down upon from my office. Now, I thought that was too lavish for what we deserve to do. But anyway, that was built right adjacent to Motherland up here in a new building. OK, quickly, what are these programs? That first thing that Rainbow Wilders got from the Air Force were radars. We built 5,500 uh, 5, of these radars, which inhabited the F-86, F-89, and F-94 interceptors. I personally got to work on the Blackbird, 
which as you know is called this, erroneously called the SR-71. It also had an interceptor version and I was partially in charge of the weapon control system and the guided missile that went into it. One thing to say about it, it was an amazing machine. We had one mission which went from California to Florida and back in three hours. As it flew over New Mexico, it fired one of our missiles, my missile, from 71,000 feet, 47 miles away from a target that was right at sea level. Direct hit. It's the first time ever look down, shoot down had been possible. Prior to this time, you always had to look up. You didn't want to get any ground return from the radar when you tried to shoot something. Well, we fixed that. Okay, the F-14, and you have one here, by the way, F-14 Tomcat, I was very active in that as well. Here we are in Iran. Iran bought 60 of them, and I went over there as a result, and I sold them 60 of our Phoenix missiles, which is the principal weapon aboard it. By the way, they got it to protect themselves against the Russians, incidentally. I had some good experiences there. I got to know the leader of the whole military as well as the leader of the Air Force. General Rabi was the first, and General Khatami was the uh, Air Force leader. Khatami was assassinated. He was a hang glider guy on his spare time, and one of his guys cut one of the wires, so he got up there and it collapsed. That was the end of him. But I mentioned Rabi, who was a marvelous guy. I really liked him. By the way, he taught me the number one food in Iran, which is called chela kebab, and I'll tell you about that if you want. Oh, excellent stuff. Anyway, he's the only person I've ever seen executed on international television. He was one of the three guys that were executed by Khomeini, as you see publicly. This is the radar that goes in the F-15 Eagle. <clears throat> that airplane for the Air Force has been a principal intercept fighter. And this is the first uh, radar that was able to do all aspect approach. No matter what aspect you look at that target, you're going to see it, no matter how slow it's going. It's an amazing radar in there. It also became the first stealth radar, and I'll say more about that in a minute. We did the radar in the B-2, which is a stealth airplane. You realize a radar has to project energy in order to do its job. It wants to see bounces off targets and then analyze those bounces. If it projects energy, you can see it. Somebody else can see it. The bad people can see it. You gotta find a way to do it without being seen, which is called stealth. Now the B2 radar can do that based on our design. And many of its features have been reintegrated or put back into many of our fighters. Stealth. Missiles, we started with the Falcon missile. There are two versions here radar and IR. We made 55,000 of these things. They were used in Vietnam, unfortunately, with a success rate of only 5%, <clears throat> which is rather horrible. <clears throat> the reason is it was mismatched to the F-4 aircraft, and I'll give you complicated reasons, but I'll skip over that. And it was, it was one of my friends who flew one of those airplanes said, it was like trying to use a football in a soccer game just a complete mismatch, but anyway, not very successful. This is the uh, Maverick. It's an air-to-ground weapon. You have an IR seeker on it. You, the pilot gets to see an image of what it's looking at. It picks a target, you put an X on it, you shoot the missile as much as 17 miles away, and it'll hit that target. Very little collateral damage, only hits the target you aimed at. You might recall seeing some of those images in the first Gulf War because uh, we went into Baghdad and we hit just discrete targets and you saw the image recorded from that missile as it went down to do its hit. Quick story about that too, there was a colonel in the Air Force who had never shot one of these before. He was assigned the job when we first left Kuwait to try to get a, a fire-free zone for the aircraft to fly up to Baghdad. The uh, Iraqis had a air defense system with a command center just across the border from Kuwait. So he took off all by himself. He made a pass over it. He'd never used this weapon before. He saw the image, shot it, knocked the thing out right away. We had a free zone all the way up to Baghdad. So when you get an effective weapon and use it properly, it is something else. There have been thousands of these made as well. And also the laser guided. The Phoenix missile I had a lot to do with. That's flying off a, I was shooting off a 
F-14 Tomcat. It can be shot 120 miles away from the target. And the big breakthrough is you can fire six of them against six separate targets that may be spaced 50 miles apart. The system will tell them where to go and so forth. So I'm very, very successful. And I had the great joy of having two test flights in F-14s, one of which we, I shot two of these, but they were captive carry in which so you're doing a testing of the electronics. You go into a shoot mode, you shoot it, then the airplane you're in flies and steers where the missile would have gone. So the real bumpy, great ride, but both were successful. <clears throat> Here's the tow missile, anti-tank. can be fired from the ground and against this from a Bradley fighting vehicle. It's uh, wire guided, good to about two and a half miles. Had the great joy of testing one of those, and by golly, I got a hit on a moving tank about a mile and a half away. I'd never shot one before either. So anyway, I'll say again, ease of use by the operator, especially in combat, is very important when you design this sort of thing. Here's the AMRAAM missile, which we design, and it's now the missile of the best in the world. Many uh, countries are using it in the uh, first war in uh, the Gulf, first Gulf War. 28 of these were launched, everyone successful. And it became a deterrent because the Iraqi Air Force pilots refused to take off, even under orders from their commander, if they knew an AMRAAM-equipped airplane was within 100 miles. They wouldn't take off. So that's a deterrent. Pretty good. We also have in the torpedo business, this is the ADCAP Mark 48 torpedo, which can do many, many things. It has several guidance systems. And even if it misses, it can turn around and hit the boat from the other side, the target. Amazing machine. We developed and perfected the laser. It was first invented, conceived by Einstein in 1917. Many people tried hard to effect it and make it happen. We were the first to do it. A guy named Dr. Theodore Merriman, <coughs> sorry, uh, did it. And that's what it looked like, that first one up in the left. We then figured out how to switch it so it could act like a radar and do ranging, laser ranging, accuracy, one quarter inch in 10 miles. Wow, pretty good. Here on the left, the lower left, you see a combined infrared sensor with laser tracker for launching missiles. And to the right is the Bradley fighting vehicle design, which is also infrared and laser. It computes where to shoot the gun. That also was a deterrent in Iraq because if they knew an M1 tank was coming, the guys would jump out of their tank and run away. They really did because it was first hit accuracy. Even when the M1 was going 40 miles an hour over rough terrain. Now that's because of the computer in that system. This is the uh, A6 uh, IR seeker hanging down from its chin. It does two different images, infrared, and makes a beautiful map of the ground for attack purposes. To the right is a high energy laser. You can see that little person there. It can be used to shoot down airplanes, missiles, and other things, which was very, very effective. And it was a shipborne device. Down below, if any of you are Boeing folk, is the AOL. This is uh, the thing which was installed in the front end of a B-47, sorry, a 747. And the purpose is to go to a high altitude and search for incoming ballistic missile packages. And it could do so at very great ranges, which I won't tell you. The success of this, which is principally infrared, was so good that it caused President Reagan to now announce the famous strategic defense uh, initiative, or uh, Star Wars, because we knew we could do it. It was proven by this system. By the way, I was delighted to come up here in Boeing and see that uh, get installed. We uh, invented the uh, electronic scan. Many radars in the old days would have to be physically moved, look from here to here to here. Now you can move beams around just electronically, electronic scan. Here's another deterrent in uh, Iraq. It's called Firefinder, used by the Marines and the Army. It detects the source of any incoming projectile, whether it be from a mortar, a cannon, or whatever, and it instantly does so instantly commands a response. And by the way, the response is very accurate. So again, the Iraqi 
our chili guys said, I'm not going to shoot this thing, because if I do my shot, I'm going to die within a minute. And it was pretty true. So it's another deterrent. I like that kind of weapon. The lower right is an um, electronic scan on, for radars on aboard ship, both looking for airplanes and other ships. And we were in about four different versions of such on different systems. Command and control. This is the Enterprise. We did the displays plus the uh, computer network for that. To the right is a mobile one used by the US Air Force for command and control for air defense in the whole region. And down below, you see one in Switzerland. We designed a system which integrates all of the electronics of Switzerland in terms of communication, air traffic control, and air defense. <clears throat> the thing that's remarkable is the antennas are on mountaintops, and in case of threat, they go down in elevators and they're protected by the mountain. Quite a design, very, very expensive, obviously. We were in space. Here's a surveyor, first soft landing device that had all kinds of uh, scientific measurements in it. And we fired, uh, we succeeded in getting five of those down of the six we built. And it was a miracle. And some of you might be old enough. Those were the first images of the Earth seen from the moon. And so it had live television. And it was quite, a, quite an excellent uh, machine, very difficult to do. We also did the uh, Venus probe. We didn't make the main bus, but we did do the entry vehicles that went to Venus and probed the atmosphere and tested all kinds of chemicals. Two of them actually survived all the way to the surface and lasted for about a half an hour, in spite of the fact that temperature is about 250 degrees Fahrenheit. And it's all uh, hydrogen sulfide or some horrible material. Synchronous satellite, geosynchronous. That means that if you can put a satellite up at about 22,000 miles above the equator, then it, that spot will appear to be fixed as the Earth rotates. In other words, it rotates exactly the same pace as the Earth. That means that on the ground, within a third of that area, you can point an antenna at it, at it and the antenna doesn't have to move. Fixed antenna. Also makes the antenna very small and high gain. So it's a um, very, very effective device. Very hard to do. This weighed 68 pounds. We achieved it in 1966, 63, sorry. And there are the uh, three inventors. As it grew, here's one that we did for the Navy called LESAT, and it all is the secure communications for the Navy worldwide. Being launched from the uh, shuttle, so the first stage was shuttle, then it had two other stages to get up to that uh, geosynchronous orbit. And here's the one that some of you may use. This is the direct TV antenna, or the satellite called the HS-601, now called the Boeing 601. Why not? And uh, that set of uh, rays for power is uh, 7 feet by 57 feet. So it's quite an array of systems. It is capable of at least 200 channels and uh, many, many other uh, data and uh, telephone lines. Now, we did many things for the public in addition for the direct TV. Lasers, as we said, as you see on the upper left, are in many colors because it's a different material you use and you get a different color. To the right, you see uh, how it can be used in the machine shop for precision cutting welding, all kinds of things. Here is eye surgery on the lower left. And of course, the DVD player, DVD disc that we use. By the way, this uh, material you're seeing is on a DVD disc. That uses a laser. And if you can read it there, that's my favorite movie, LA Confidential. Night vision, which is used by the uh, police, as well as by Insulation people, if you're looking at a house like this, you can tell where it's badly insulated because the red is where the uh, heat is coming out of the place. So you know exactly where to put insulation. Digital watch, we invented that. We tried to produce it for two years and got put out of business by cheaper manufacturers. The cell phone, there are billions of cell phones in the world. The signal processor in it, 
we designed as part of our radars at the time, this would be 1980, we had the capability of uh, 238 million operations per second with that device. I think it's more like a billion now that's used in all of these cell phones as the same design. To the left, you see the airline entertainment business. We invented a way to multiplex the data so that all those TV channels can be done on one wire. So only one wire comes from the source to all those different stations, and yet you get all that material on it. It's amazing. And there's the fixed antenna used for direct TV. It's only 18 inches big. Microelectronics, we worked on that very heavily. We had two patents which are still used. Microelectronic devices are usually a set of wafers with different materials. You have to interconnect those, so we invented the bumps that are used to discreetly interconnect where you want to and where you don't want to. And we also did something called ion implantation, where you put ions in to change the behavior of some of the chemicals. And uh, as a result, you see what on to the right is a uh, thumb uh, thumb memory, <coughs> thumb drive, which has 13 gigahertz, gigabytes of memory on it, enormous amount. So for example, these slides, I think it could be 20 of these uh, sets of slides on um, one of those little tiny things because of our microelectronics. Okay, how did we get to be so good? How did we be successful? We're, why were we successful? First of all, the Howard Hughes Credo, credo do it better, reach beyond and always try to excel. Don't give up. That's the first one. Okay, then uh, technical leadership. All of our managers for about eight layers were all technical. We had a few financial people, but rarely, and they had very little authority. That was important, I think, to do what we did. We were privately owned for many, many years. That meant we could have long range goals not worry about our quarterly profits that the stockholders would demand. That gave us the opportunity to reinvest in research and development in many, many different ways. We had a uh, unique recruiting system. For example, I was recruited because I went to a master's fellowship uh, program that we sponsored. And during my career there, we sponsored 4,000 master's fellows which got their advanced degrees, which helped us enormously technically, as well as was a real magnet for attracting new talent. We also <clears throat> had an internal education system, which had something like 5,000 courses over the, about 20 years that were keep the technical people up to date. And as I earlier said, integrity. Integrity was it. Oop, that's Howard later, wait a minute. Okay, now, how do you inspire creativity? Um, my time's about up, so I'll skip that, and we can ask questions about that. I think that's the most important part about the book. How do you inspire integrity with a large group of people? We had 85,000, 22,000 were science and engineers. I was delighted because every day I'd see something new that had never been done before. Very inspiring. How do you get the people to act like that? There's Howard, just about the time he was going to pass. He died in, at 19, in 1976 at the age of only 70 and a couple of months. He died somewhere between Mexico and the United States. It's still unknown. It's important to get him back to the United States, so he had U.S. citizenship when he died. And there's the Howard Hughes Medical Institute, which I mentioned is now worth about $30 billion. Many people have asked if I met Howard Hughes. Well, I did see him in the corridor once, didn't get to meet him because I was just a junior startup engineer. But I got to meet a guy who was his fourth cousin called Will Lummis. He was the one that settled the estate. As you know, uh, Howard died intestate and everybody was claiming they owned their asset, this, that, and the other thing. Will Lummis was a lawyer from Houston who settled it. And I went to a big affair in Santa Monica that welcomed that once he was a principal speaker. We're all there in black tie, and there's a dais up there with seven seats, one missing. We all had our salad, and we're wondering, where is this guy? Well, it turns out his plane was late, but the curtain flew open in the back. He strode in, sat down, and then addressed us. He looked exactly like Howard Hughes. 
sounded like him. So as we got through the, the will part, when I was working with him, I said, how is it that you're so much like Howard Hughes? And he said in his Texas hat, said, I don't have any idea. He said, I only met him once. I never knew him. So but it's amazing, dead ringer. Okay, what is the history? Where do we stand today? Up on the upper left is called the Hercules Campus. Our motherland has been preserved as a state historic site. 11 buildings cannot be touched on the outside, but can be redone on the inside. A corporation named Ratkovich has done so and is leasing out the space to operations. There is the upper left is the uh, space between the two executive buildings that we had. To the right is Howard Hughes' office panels before they were completely refurbished, but those have been preserved. <coughs> then the lower left is myself and the wonderful Cy Ramo that made most of this possible. At the time, he was 98. He is now 102. And this year, he got another patent of his hundreds of patents. So he's the oldest person ever to receive a patent. Really an amazing guy. And I'd say after he left us, he created the Remo Wildridge Corporation. Very, very successful. And to the right is the book that will give you at least one drop in an ocean of history, but one which I think is very vital for the future of the United States. In other words, to be copied by other institutions so they remain technically ahead and be creative. Thank you very much. Mr. Richardson. Uh, you're welcome. <clears throat> so at this time, we will be taking questions. I'm going to turn both mics on. And then so if you have questions, come on up. Please ask a real hard one. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, I have two questions for you. Uh, first one, are there any Hughes aircraft that are still like on display anywhere that we can see at some point? The, um, <clears throat> excuse me, when GM sold us, it was the 70% was purchased by Raytheon, about another 10% uh, or so by Boeing, another by um, World Communication, the Communication Corporation that bought DirecTV, and then uh, one other piece. The only remaining piece with a huge name is, I think, in uh, Greenbelt, Maryland, which make, made the ground systems to respond to transmissions from uh, satellites. It has a huge name, but I actually don't know who owns it. But a uh, huge name is gone. And by the way, another grouse I have is many times when a company is acquired by somebody else, they put a dash in front of it. So you know you got both names preserved, but that wasn't done for us. No. Uh, the other question I had was, um, was there really like a really intense rivalry between uh, Howard and Juan Tripp, as portrayed in a lot of media? Yes, uh, very accurate, yes. They were really a uh, counter, and you saw TWA, and much of which was expanded to fight uh, Pan Am. And the overseas, overseas routes, routings, were very highly contested, so they didn't like each other. Yes. Thank you. Hello, uh, thanks very much for coming. I was curious. There's a lot of companies today, particularly technical companies, that start out with a real definite vision, and then as the company grows, they kind of they lose their mobility. I'm curious how your company managed to stay so active and mobile as they got big. Difficult one to answer. It's a very complex question. I, I would say it this way. I mentioned that one of the reasons that we were so successful was private ownership. That allowed us to have a very long-term goal. It allowed us to tolerate errors as we went, as we tried to fix things and make it come out right. So to be, be the best, to make the best device, often takes a long time. So you have to be persistent and patient. You can do that when you're privately owned. When you're publicly owned, which many of the corporations are, you can't do that, because the stockholders, based on the US culture, demand that every quarter you show an increase in earnings. 
Otherwise, the stock goes down in value, attributed value, sales value, whatever you want to say. So I think that's the dilemma that, that many of these companies face. They can't have a long-term vision which perseveres long enough to maintain internal research and development funding and the willingness of people to work a long time before they see the result. I think that's the problem. Uh, what do you do about it? I don't know. Thank you. Well, I've got a little more of a technical question that and maybe my um, observations aren't correct, but it seems to me that today most of the U.S. military is relying upon GPS navigation. And seeing as how GPS is reliant upon basically low-level satellites with so many countries having the ability to get to that height and knock them out of the air, why is it that the internal navigation systems that were prevalent and used in the 60s in the Minuteman and in the Sin submarine uh, is no longer used in this other system that strikes me as being much more vulnerable as superseded it? Well, it's a very accurate question. <clears throat> I don't have a good answer for it because I'm not current, especially from a classified data standpoint. I would certainly hope that the military has backup systems, such as you just said, inertial navigation built in, a number of other ways to encode the data they want in order to do the navigation job. The reason that GPS is so successful is it's so outstanding and so excellent. As you probably know, it takes 24 to 36 satellites continuously in orbit to be able to do that. You do a look at three different ones and you measure their distance and all that sort of thing to figure out how it works. It's superbly good. So once you get a device that works better than everything you've ever seen, you tend to focus and use that alone. But I'll repeat myself, since I'm not classified anymore, I have to presume that the military especially will have at least two backup systems because you're right, that GPS system is extremely vulnerable. Thirty-five years ago, um, the Navy was introducing the Target Recognition Attack Multisensor, or the TRAM system, which was a used product. Yes. I was involved deeply with that from the Navy side, and it absolutely changed the way we did business on finding and attacking ground targets. Could you talk a little bit more, particularly the the cryogenics, you had a guy by the name of Tibor Lodi, I don't know whether you knew oh, him. Oh, yes, yeah. At, who, who was a crazy, <laughs> he was hard to talk to, because he, but regardless. Uh, it, but it, it worked so well, it was just unbelievable what uh, our bombardier navigators would come back from the first flight with one of those things, and just, they were just aghast at what they, what they could do now. That's marvelous to hear you say that, that feels good. The uh, for the, those of you who don't understand what a TV, I mean, a infrared tracking system is, or mapping system, that's what the tram was. And it was, had two different uh, modes, but one of the, let's say you're gonna get a large map. It has a scanning device, which is infrared sensitive, and measures the inputs it sees as it goes along. Now, it visualizes a television raster, back and forth, back and forth. And a television is 525 lines per, per second, I think, something like that. So you do about the same thing, and you get all that data. You now analyze the data, and you turn it into a picture which is recognizable by the operator. The many issues in doing that properly, especially treating the raster, getting the data properly, and so forth, but one of the most vital things is to have an IR detector which is sensitive enough to see the slightest temperature differences, like a tenth of a degree Fahrenheit you can measure if you've got an extremely sensitive detector. The way you do it is you use a certain material, you cool it to liquid nitrogen or even colder uh, purposes. You then use it to look through an optical system 
that won't pollute that temperature or anything, but then it will be very, very super sensitive so that each little spot that it looks at will be very, very high resolution. Well, that's what we achieved through the cryogenic system. It's a way of supplying cold energy instead of having a liquid fuel. You have a way to electrically pump the temperature down. And therefore, you can have a very low temperature sensor, very sensitive, which will give you that high re resolution for those pictures. So there's a very, very complex set of uh, mechanics in there as well as uh, computer stuff to make that picture look so real. Thank you for saying it was very effective because we were very proud of it. So. Okay, in terms of the best defense electronics company, Hughes, and nowadays, what do you think uh, worldwide, like a BAE, Northrop Grumman, Lockheed Martin? And also, can you comment on what your experience looking at Boeing? Boeing is a system integrator and then tried to form the Boeing Electronics in 1989 and they failed. So can you comment on that? Uh, that's a politically sensitive question. I'm not <laughs> I, I'm going to take a breathe or escape on it by saying I'm not very well informed. But I do have a set of talks I've made uh, relative to the decline of the US in terms of its technical leadership. For 100 years, we were the leader throughout the world in all technologies. Maybe not all, but almost all technologies. We're now ranked either four or 27, depending on how you evaluate it. So you have a larger question than you said, how come some of the companies haven't survived very well? It's a national crisis, I think. Why? Why is that so? I'm not sure I know why. It's the education system. It's the orientation of the culture. I'd much rather do entertainment than do other important things. And I don't have a good answer. That's why I again have to say, my old foundation, Hughes Aircraft Company, was absolutely unique. And we were at the forefront of absolutely everything. I didn't mention we were the number one military electronics contractor in the world largest employer in California and Arizona. And I mentioned the research labs were rated number one in the world. And we maintained that for many, many years because of the way we did things. Why aren't the other companies doing that? I don't know, except for that one thing I mentioned, short-term profit. Yes. And to be a real terrible engineer comment, when you get the finance people involved, in leadership, they don't have the technical wisdom to make it come out right. Sorry. That's a, that's a very biased comment, but there's so many illustrations of that. You've got to have technical people running technical companies. Thank you. Thank you. I'm glad nobody threw a rotten egg at me for that one. It's politically well, sensitive. My question was sort of related to that. I mean, I, I think there's a decline ability in the American aerospace industry, given an uh, example like F-35 and other programs similarly. I understand this education system, but I think the other problem is that you're not attracting the best and brightest into those industries. Excellent. Very true. Uh, and second, the, this, from what you described in talking, working with admirals and so forth, I will say there may, have, there may be a lot more political interference in these programs. Both points well made. I, I would uh, say that one of the benefits we had was a national goal. Our goal for most of the time I was there was to make sure that we did not fail in the Cold War. And because of what we did, and the things we invented, we actually ran the Soviets out of their economy. They couldn't afford to keep up, and there was no combat. That's kind of nice. But we had a national goal. What is our national goal today? I don't know. There, there isn't one. What's that? Somebody made a comment. Uh, so I think that's uh, part of the problem. 
And I was going to give another. I can answer. I can answer that question. Is okay. our national goal seems to be be fair, be equitable. Everybody should all earn the same amount of money, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. Right. Okay. Fifteen dollars an hour minimum wage. <laughs> yeah, I, th I think it's again, it's the it's the culture forcing that sort of thing to happen. I, w I was going to give another comment there. Um, Yes. Yeah, can you Is mention? Let me finish. The oh, excuse me. Complaint. I, I don't want to sound like a complaint, but I wish it would be different. There is a almost fanaticism in this country not to take risk, to make sure that you do it right so that you don't get caught, that you don't have some lawyer sue you, or you don't damage this, that, and the other thing. Don't take any risk. When you, as soon as you say that, you're not going to make any advance because you have to be willing to take risks and do things that uh, might be well done. I mean, might be better done if you are more free thinking. The second thing is because of that risk thing and the expectation that the government controls everything, the government's uh, control of paperwork, when you take one step and you want to do something else, you have to get approval several uh, approvals and so forth. And I'll give you two illustrations. One is that Phoenix missile I mentioned. We did a, we were caught once. That's not the right word. We were accused of not having adequate reliability, which isn't correct. Processing reliability, manufacturing reliability. But we analyzed it. 687 specification pages were applicable to that one missile. How in the world? And a lot of them conflicted one from another because people want to be safe. Don't do this, don't do that. Another example, I mentioned I got the great chance to work on the YF-12 Blackbird with uh, Kelly Johnson and the Skunk Works. The Skunk Works contract for that airplane was two pages long. Our contract for the weapon system within it was one page long. It said, here's what you want to do. Get the radar to see something at this range be able to look down, shoot down, be able to shoot a target, this one, you do it. And we made all the decisions. And this, if I highlight that one time, when I first came on the program, I was the fourth person allowed to on our company. I immediately went out to Lockheed. I'd do that secretly. I never told my family where I worked for three years. Went out to Burbank and went in there, and I got look, to look at the drawings of the airplane. I then went back to the plant down in Culver City, I worked till two in the morning, and I called up a guy there. I said, we, you need to make the airplane what, one foot longer to accommodate our system, otherwise it won't fit. He said, I'll let you know tomorrow. 10 o'clock that morning, got a fall. These are all uh, guard, guarded uh, telephone lines. Got a phone call that says, you got it. We're expanding the airplane one foot. If you try to do that today, It'd take you three years. I'm not kidding. So there is a way to do things which takes shortcuts, takes risks, but gets a far better result. One more point. The YF-12 was analyzed, or the uh, SR-71, let's do it a different way. Work done in the Skunk Works cost half what it would be otherwise in the open area and took a third of the time that's proven fact. OK, long time. You get me worked up. Why doesn't, why doesn't uh, the culture see that and do something about it? Blah, blah, blah. OK, sorry. You have a way of igniting old memories. <laughs> yeah, Ken, you mentioned the outstanding technical education program, the yes. fellowship programs, and the after hours program. Yes. And then there was also the outstanding supervisor development program that I had a chance to participate in. Who were the managers who had the foresight to start and support those programs? You're making me be too modest. I started the first one of those, and then it was expanded into three other different uh, categories. And my lady Charlotte there uh, was the manager of one of those. So it was very, very successful because one thing I didn't mention, I did say, we were a family. We felt to be a family. And one of the things we did that other companies don't do is we shared data. 
one from another, one manager to another. Here's what I did. Here's why it works better. Why don't you try this, that sort of thing. Technically, we did the same thing. I mentioned that uh, ADCAP torpedo. It's wire guided to start with when it's launched from the submarine. The tow missile is wire guided. So the people who were responsible for the uh, torpedo, which are in a different, completely different part of the company, called up the head of the missile company outfit, said, we need some help designing that wire dispenser and make it work. We sent five guys out there for six months, and it was 50 miles away, so they had a very difficult family situation to do that. And we passed on all that technical data to that bunch, so you made a jump rather than having invented all over again. So that sort of thing is absolutely vital, and I don't think that happens now because managers are competitive with other managers within the same company. They want to look better, so they don't tell them any secrets. Crazy. Anyway, how to get in all that, right? On a lighter vein, uh, <laughs> regard, regard the Spruce Goose, my understanding was when Howard was doing taxiing tests, the FAA gave him only permission for taxiing tests and not flight. Is that true or not? That's, cr that's very true. Once again, I have to say, the FAA didn't want to have anything bad go wrong. Safety, don't take risk. Howard had said, if that airplane doesn't fly, I'm gonna leave the country. He had an incentive to say, I can do it. And he reached beyond what was perceived to be a limit. So that is true, but I'm glad he violated the mandate from the government. Sorry, I'm not a revolutionary, but wow. Anyway, yes. I had the privilege of working for you and the company for about 34 years. And I want to thank you for writing the book. It, it really portrays the, the unique nature of the company and what happened to it, unfortunately. But your analysis of the environment and innovation and creativity, and you made the book really easy for everybody to understand, which is the other thing. It's highly technical subjects, but you did a super job, and thank you for doing it. You're very kind. Thank you very much. You, that, you, Melanie, uh, you said that was recorded, right? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for that. All right, then. I'd like to thank everyone for coming, and that superb book is available for purchase today, and Mr. Richardson will be happy to sign it. Um, and so, um, again, thank you for coming, and we will have our book signing um, at the table outside of the gift shop. Thank you, Mr. Richardson. Thank you.